I'll just wait a few more seconds. Okay, it's probably fine to go now. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on preserving our remaining wildlife. Uh, I'm Adam, I'll be chairing the session. Um, so I'm a member of the Young Flavians. In my day job, I work in the RSPB's political team. Um, so first I'll kind of let the other panelists introduce themselves uh, before I kind of quickly set the scene about biodiversity loss and then we'll hear the panelists thoughts on, on a few questions relating to how we can best preserve our remaining wildlife and reverse biodiversity loss. So keen for it to be more of like an interactive discussion so if you have any questions then do input them into the Q&A and I'll try to bring them in at an appropriate moment whether that's in between uh, panelists answers or at the end after the, the responses. Uh, Edward, if you want to introduce yourself first. Yeah, of course. So my name is Ed Dean. Uh, I'm the Director of Development at an organisation called Ashton. Uh, and Ashton is devoted to accelerating climate solutions for a just world. So I'm not directly involved in nature conservation, but in the last two years, Ashton has started to prioritise what are being called natural climate solutions. So the role of nature in tackling climate change. Last year we had an award for the second city of Colombia, which is called Medellin, that had greened itself for biodiversity, for people and for urban cooling. This year we gave an award to an organisation uh, of indigenous people in the Amazon who'd been collecting seeds uh, and encouraging biodiverse planting in the Amazon. So we're really interested in the role of nature to tackle climate change and all the multiple benefits for people and society and wildlife that flow from that way of considering the natural world. Thanks. Um, thanks. Uh, Gitanjali, do you want to go next? Um, I'm Gitanjali. I'm a conservation biologist and I head up uh, ZSL's uh, international fundraising. So ZSL is the Zoological Society of London. Um, we are a global wildlife charity that focuses on ensuring a world where wildlife thrives. Um, this involves working in 50 countries around the world um, and our focus is predominantly working to save species from extinction, um, working on some of the world's most rarest species, but also working closely with local communities to ensure that they're able to live in harmony with the wildlife um, that they live alongside. And also with our two zoos, we are engaged with engaging people and building that deeper connection with nature. Ah, thanks. And James? Good evening, everyone. I'm James Wallace. I'm a co-founder and director of the Beaver Trust. We were set up just a year ago to help communities with locally led nature restoration projects, particularly around riparian and river habitats through the release and reintroduction of beavers as ecosystem engineers that help us with climate and biodiversity natural solutions. So working in line with humans to solve the problems that we have at the moment. And the work we're undertaking at the moment and have been for the past year is to engage with government and key stakeholders from the fishing, farming, forestry community, NGOs, environmental organisations and community groups to develop a strategy for beavers and riparian habitat restoration in England and more broadly in Britain and to then work with uh, various different agencies and a networked approach on education and communication to try and raise awareness and reconnect people with the rest of the natural world that sustains us. Ah, oh, thanks. I know there's been lots of exciting beaver related news recently, so that's great. Yeah. Um, so just to quickly set the scene, so it's undeniable that the UK's wildlife is facing an unprecedented threat. So last year, the State of Nature report found that 41% of UK species have declined since 1970, and 50%, 15 of them are at risk of extinction. So the recent ITBES report found that the UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. And we haven't made significant progress on nearly all of our 2020 HE biodiversity targets. So this is due to like a multitude of factors, which I'm sure the panelists will expand on later, you know, things like intensive agriculture, climate change, urbanization, pollution, to name a few. Uh, there's definitely been mixed messages in the UK as to whether we're up to the task of reversing this biodiversity loss. On the one hand, we have kind of supposedly ambitious pieces of legislation like the Environment Bill, and the Agriculture Bill currently passing through Parliament. 
as well as the UK hosting COP26 in 2021, with a focus on nature-based solutions to climate change, as well as this government debatably calling themselves the greenest government ever. Um, then on the other hand, all of these bills feature major loopholes, and there hasn't been clear signs yet that the government will show the global leadership necessary to make COP26 a success for nature and climate. You know, a supposed green recovery only contains a fraction of funding for wildlife protection, Despite being a nation of nature lovers, you know, in the 2018 CAF report, only 4% of giving to charities went to conservation and environment, and 8% went to animal welfare. Um, slightly somber picture, I suppose, but to kind of move on to the, the first question for the panelists. Um, so what would you kind of say um, is your diagnosis of the reasons and drivers behind, you know, undeniable catastrophic loss of biodiversity over the past 50 years? So this can be kind of um, politically, culturally, economically, et cetera, and either in the UK or, or globally as well. So, Edward, do you want to go first? Yeah, no, thanks, Adam. I think you've named some of them that are, that are kind of very well documented in the recent State of Nature report, habitat loss, unsustainable and extractive agriculture, pollution, hydrological change, climate change, invasive species. But I think it's also interesting to think about the kind of um, the deeper reasons, perhaps, uh, in terms of people's behaviour, uh, uh, market and profit-driven approach to economy, you can see nature is there to be exploited for gain, rather than having a relationship that is generative and, and based on reciprocity. So I, I think what, while there are, there are key kind of scientific reasons why we've lost so much biodiversity, uh, it's important to look at that kind of deeper lack of connection with the natural world. I think the other thing, especially recently with our experience in looking at the role of indigenous communities in land stewardship, there's important questions uh, around land ownership and land stewardship uh, that we think of in a global, uh, global South context often, but even in the UK, uh, the, the, if I can say this, the wildlife sector can be timid in its challenge to, to incumbent land managers and, and developers. So there's a need to look at some of those deeper relationships, I think. Ah, uh, James, do you want to go next? Well, funny enough, I was about to say a very similar thing to Ed there about land ownership, land use and economics. And I, I will come to that in a second. First thing I'd like to observe uh, is our, our language. And this is no, in no order, uh, but even using, uh, and this is no criticism of the, uh, of the organizers of this event, but using the term preserving rather than conserve and restore, I think is very much speaks for how ingrained we are in this, how are we going to save what's left mindset rather than how are we going to thrive and restore abundance in the living world that we're a part of. Uh, the second thing I was going to say is, again, similar to Ed, in that um, it's, it's really, about, really about reconnecting people with the world that sustains them and seeing uh, that when we, when we treat the world that uh, feeds, waters, houses and clothes us uh, badly, then we're damaging ourselves too. And there's nothing new in saying that. Um, but I think it ties up very, very closely with land ownership, land use and economics uh, situations. So just briefly on farming, uh, the common agricultural policy that we will be leaving uh, soon post Brexit and it's coming to an end anyway um, drives industrialization of uh, our landscape and productivity and it's, it rewards produce it doesn't reward stewardship uh, again nothing new in saying that but I'm encouraged to see that in the in the policy realm that there are now new forms of uh, ecosystem services reward systems that are coming through which are going to incentivize we would hope and reward landowners land managers uh, river managers too and so that it might reverse the denuding of our landscape and inspire and encourage those people responsible for stewarding our land um, and, 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 and make sure there's no clash as there currently could be when it comes to their economics, because everyone needs to make a living. Um, and then uh, I, I reminded, just to give an example, um, I used to run an organization uh, called Nectum, uh, Deep Ocean Research Organization, so very different to what I'm doing now. And uh, we, we ran an expedition to Bermuda. And whilst we were preparing for that, we were, we were diving in submersibles. And uh, we had some footage from someone who was diving in uh, the Mediterranean. And I was completely blown away because there was at the bottom of the sea, there was a, a ship, a warship from World War II that landed in the sediment and stayed there. And in its wake, because of the gyre effect of the sea, 
a lot of the Mediterranean plastic had formed a line in its wake, a mountain underwater, even just modeling as if it were what happens on the surface in the sea. So these things very much are about out of sight, out of mind as well. So it's again linked to this whole disconnect to nature. How can we try and connect our livelihoods and, and our minds and our hearts with the natural world and to try and see beneath the waves, metaphorically speaking, at what's, uh, what's going on? Fab. And uh, yeah, I, I suppose just on the, the kind of environmental land management skill, uh, schemes coming out of the Agriculture Bill, it's been quite interesting to see not just those, you know, farm level interventions like cover crops and, and wildflower margins, but also them kind of reaching to kind of landscape scale interventions. And I think kind of preserving that ambition in, in those schemes is, is really important for the NGOs going forward. Uh, Gitanjali, do you want to go next? Um, so there's undeniably we're in this global catastrophic decline and i think i'm going to take a step back and look at it more from a global perspective um i think if you look at the living planet index that's produced by zsl uh, collating data we've experienced a 60 percent loss of wildlife in the last 50 years and i think we need to take a pause and think about that number that is a catastrophic loss of decline. I think it's numbers so big that most of us can't quite grapple with that. But if you think about it, in my lifetime, it's sort of losing half the species that you know we've known. Um, you know, all of us on this group, I don't need to repeat the figures because we're all familiar with it. But you know, the you know, my daughter came out the other day and was talking about the fact that we're losing 30 football pitches of rainforests every minute. That is, that is horrific. Um, and the fact that this goes on on our watch at a time that we're in an enlightened period, um, when people are aware of our dependence on nature, I think, you know, it, there is pause here for us as a group to really think about it as a group. Um, you know, and we've got the characteristics. So there's a huge amount of research that's been done on this. Um, we're documenting the rates of decline and attributing it to different causes. Um, I'm chief amongst those, in addition to everything that Ed mentioned, Ed and James have mentioned, we've got habitat loss, you know, and, you know, we're looking at climate change, we're looking at really overexploitation, we're looking at invasive species that are at a massive rate, um, you know, there's a huge amount of work that's being done. Um, and I think in the times that we are in, we need to think about wildlife disease. And I think a lot of that is really about the intensification and our overexploitation of natural resources. So I think there's a lot to be done and there's a lot of data that's out there. But I think, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to speaking with this panel and uh, with the audience really about how we engage to take it back because the numbers out there are horrific, but we know we've seen um, from the brilliant work that's being done around, that there is a lot to be done and we can reverse that decline. Uh, um, yeah, my second question is on COVID-19. I don't want to preempt what anyone will say, but I thought it was really interesting uh, what you were saying, Gitan Jilly, about the link between habitat loss and uh, diseases. I mean, COVID-19 is, is a prime example of this, really. And, you know, people saying that the amount of deforestation going on in the Amazon, that could be the next hotbed of of COVID-like diseases, I mean, full of species that we haven't even encountered before, I think is quite quite terrifying, really. But um, so, I mean, COVID-19 is, is obviously an unprecedented event for both individuals and the economy. Um, so, I mean, my, my day job in the RSPB has definitely changed drastically in what we do day to day, but also how we advocate for, for wildlife and for nature. Um, so I'm just wondering how have you and your organisations perceived the public's relationship with wildlife change over time? And what sort of opportunities do you think that this year has created for the environment sector? As well as obviously, how can we ensure that this change isn't lost as we return back to normal life? Uh, Gisanjali, do you want to go first this time? Um, absolutely. So at ZSL, you know, we've, you know, we've got a very strong department that's focused looking at zoonotic diseases um, and the transfer of diseases. And actually we talk about this being unprecedented, but actually we've, anticipated that an epidemic of this, a pandemic of this nature might be on the horizon. Um, and as, as you mentioned earlier, Adam, the closer we are to nature, we, we're in ever closer contact. Um, and with the overexploitation and the transportation of, and the illegal wildlife trade, which we haven't touched on as yet, which is a really key 
factor that we need to think about in this post-COVID world, um, you know, and how we regulate it. We are in ever increasing contact with wildlife. So from the perspective of ZSL um, and us as an organization, it's really around, so it's a two-pronged approach. It's around identifying and working closely um, to study zoonotic diseases and being able to anticipate um, you know, and how do you mitigate and stop the next pandemic from happening? But it's also with working with local communities and preserving and, you know, well, James and I have this conversation. Um, it's around, you know, conserving and preserving intact ecosystems to the best of our ability. Um, it's working with local communities because, um, and Ed's referred to this earlier, there's an increasing disconnect with nature. Um, and, you know, that intact ecosystem involves us so it's working really closely so it's really working with local communities it's working to make sure that we are really preserving intact ecosystems and it's really looking at zoonotic diseases and the transmission um, i think one thing that i will refer to from a global context in terms of how people's um, relation has changed with um, wildlife we've seen from data emerging from asia and particularly around migrant communities returning home um, when livelihoods dry up in urban centers back um, to the local communities in these villages and the increasing dependence on uh, natural resources, which puts an immense amount of pressure. Um, we know that livelihoods are drying up in these urban centers and so illegal wildlife trade becomes an even greater risk in these areas. Um, and again, there is the potential of upsetting that balance in nature as you get people into ever increasingly close contact with wildlife species. So I think there's many lessons to be learned around here. It's about, and I think the world at this point is really looking at it in silos and looking at it as the economic um, symptoms and looking at the health symptoms. But I think we need to be looking at this more holistically um, as one um, ecosystem that we really need to be working towards. Yeah, that's a really important point. Um, James, do you want to answer next? Yeah, uh, well, just at a personal level to start off with, I'm a father of two young girls aged 11 and just 13 last week. And even though they were brought up as keen naturalists and bird watchers, they are one of thousands and thousands of youngsters who have, or two of thousands and thousands of youngsters who are getting even more involved in the natural world. And those that haven't had that privilege or that opportunity afforded to them are, are, you know, without a doubt, we're seeing, for example, BBC Spring Watch this year, for me personally, and maybe a little biased because our Cornwall Beaver Project featured every day for three weeks, um, we, saw, we saw a different level of connection between the presenters, the public, and, uh, and nature and the natural world. It was really heartwarming to see that. However, I will say, uh, and I'm sure we, we've all seen it plenty in the news, that whilst we see an uptake and an interest, it takes time for behaviours to become ingrained and changed. So how long after with the lockdown did we see beaches in the south of England reporting 30 tonnes of plastic and other waste left after one day of a few thousand visitors that that just shows we we're still selfish animals we still so we still look after our own interests and we take quite a long time to adapt and change however i i'm seeing and, and my colleagues too and the people we work with quite a an a, 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 um, easy to recognize groundswell of activity within community so just, just as just and jolly has been saying and we've mentioned in the previous question um if we can if we can encourage and support local community action where people are taking their own, uh, not just livelihoods, but their own landscape into, uh, into their everyday lives and take action themselves, make their own decisions. Uh, of course, uh, policymakers, funders, uh, experts and so on, practitioners need to be able to support those communities. And, and many of us on this call and listening will be working in those fields themselves. Um, if we, if we recognise that groundswell of activity, then we should listen to it too. And I think it's very, very important that the future, uh, as we look at a green recovery uh, post COVID-19, or maybe post is too ambitious a word, but as we get used to this new world of living with pandemics, um, we should be thinking of a green recovery that empowers and enables locals and local communities to work together. And that to me includes not, not, not only a dog walker, a school kid, a parent or whatever, it's the people, again, who I said earlier on, who manage our land. And to remember that they are our parents, they are our friends, they are relations, they are not bad people who've, who've you know, farmed the land in a way that maybe wasn't quite sustainable. These are, these are us that we're talking about. We are fishers, we are farmers, we are foresters. So if we can go about our conservation work and our restoration work to restore biodiversity with community at our heart, then I think we'll find a much, uh, a much better response. 
And then finally, um, as an organization, Beaver Trust, uh, as an example, we work with communities. So uh, what we've observed coming into this world of nature conservation, where you have very large organizations who often because of their uh, need to attract members and they have a, a large infrastructure and staffing to look after, um, end up finding it quite hard to work in full collaboration with others. And, and this is no criticism of it, it's just the way the system works. There are scant resources, let's be honest about this. Um, very scant for the environment. What is it? Is it three, five percent of overall funding goes towards uh, environment and most of the rest goes on humanitarian and education for good reason. But we need to put more funding into the environment. So if we can help channel that funding and support those communities, uh, as we're doing now with the Beaver Trust. And I think we're going to see more reciprocal relationships where people will unlock horns and rather than being very precious about a particular species or habitat type or a particular livelihood or a person or group, we can start working much more together and recognizing that we are all one and we all need to do this with a very considerable sense of urgency. Climate change is not going away. Yeah, totally. And I, I managed to catch a little bit of Springwatch this year and I thought those moments of of like mindfulness and, and nice imagery of, of wildlife, I think was a really powerful moment. And just that kind of admiring nature for existing and kind of being there for us in, in the pandemic, I thought was, may not have happened in, in normal times really. So uh, uh, Ed, do you want to answer next? Yeah, I mean, I would mirror what everyone said really. I mean, on a personal level, uh, I think the lockdown has enabled me to spend even more time with nature. So that's been amazing. I think that's mirrored ac across across the country, really. And, and I, I also watched that Spring Watch. I thought it was amazing. I think there, there are other things that are emerging, and some of them are paradoxical. So I think from a climate change point of view, COVID has been, and it seems kind of wrong to say this, but it's definitely true, kind of instructive in how fragile our systems are. And I think there's it, it and it's building a narrative uh, around green recovery, but also around kind of the, the, the resilience that we need in our systems, whether they're economic or uh, whether they're urban infrastructure, whatever they might be. Early, early in the lockdown, there were some am amazing images that, that have stayed with me, the, the clear air of New Delhi, uh, being able to see right into the distance. And from again, from a sort of climate change perspective, the the opportunity now to really push harder on cleaning up air pollution, whether well, that's uh, through legal challenge or through um, encouraging active mobility in cities, there's a, there's a massive opportunity there that's, that's actually been created by this terrible crisis. Um, the, the other kind of opportunities here are really, uh, you know, there's a need for more volunteers. Um, I, I started in the NG, NGO world volunteering for something that was called the British Trust of Conservation Volunteers back in, back in the 90s. So, so volunteering is really important and volunteers play an essential role. And again, volunteers are people who are connected to nature in their community. So is this an opportunity to recruit even more volunteers because of that resurgence of, it, of interest? citizen science is a, is a greater opportunity here to involve citizens in the monitoring of wildlife which is such an important factor really I think it's such an important part and then finally I think for me I think we may come on to talk a bit more about this the the crisis has created a, a really strong political and social mandate for green recovery um, and perhaps we'll go on to talk about the, the current government's position on that and what more could be done. But nevertheless, there is a political and social mandate that, that it's the obligation of organisations like Ashton and other environmental NGOs to build on that mandate and work really hard to get money and policies embedded uh, over the next year. I think. Yeah, well, that very nicely segues into the next question. And I think, um, especially on the uh, point about making use of volunteers. I think it's been really interesting to see the proposals from the wildlife and countryside link around that national nature service and mobilizing a lot of new people, especially younger people to kind of volunteer and have entry level jobs into the conservation sector has been a really powerful idea. And I think that's kind of shown in how quickly it's gained traction within government as well, but part of their green recovery response. Um, but kind of the final question, so on a policy level, 
um, the Green Recovery, the UK hosting COP26 and various other moments all create important opportunities for the UK to show global leadership on protecting wildlife and reversing biodiversity loss and in, most importantly to prompt similar levels of action occurring in other countries. So what does the government do you think needs to be doing to achieve this both in the immediate term with the green recovery and then over the next 12 months and I think including some kind of concrete examples of policies or pieces of legislation that you think should be passed would, would be super helpful for the people watching. Um, Ed do you want to go first? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so I think um, it's it's we sh we should acknowledge, you know, that the the current government ha have pledged. I think it's three billion uh, uh, into the sort of into to kind of green greening the economy, uh, and that's really welcome. Uh, I think a lot of that will be focused on retrofit, which is a massively important area for um, mitigating climate change and taking us towards Paris goals. But the German government have pledged 37 billion, I believe. So, so I think there's a need for greater investment. Um, I think there's a need to involve um, and empower local authorities who are often the arbiters of that investment at a local level um, much more greatly. Um, so I think that, uh, and we need to look beyond the, the, as well as looking at retrofit, we need to look at other kind of green investments that are needed, including in green infrastructure in our cities, that, where nature can play a massive role uh, in terms of mitigating climate change, urban cooling, uh, and other ecosystem services, but also in, in encouraging and uh, developing greater biodiversity in, in, in the places where most of us live. So I think um, I haven't got any sort of specific you know, changes or policies, I, th I think I would want to see uh, consistency, which is really important to, to encourage investment into the natural world, consistency over the next few years, and uh, greater investment and a greater kind of spread of investment into different areas in terms of the, the green recovery. So, so really, a, a bigger Green New Deal uh, is what I would love to see. Um, the, the other thing I think might be worth saying that there are some other amazing opportunities coming up, such as COP26. Um, and COP26, I think, is a, is a great uh, opportunity for the UK to show, show leadership uh, in, in all sorts of areas. But I think in terms of natural climate solutions, the, the UK could, could show real leadership, in, again, in investing in natural climate solutions and bringing people and wildlife together through um, demonstrating those sorts of solutions across the across the country and for the economy um, and providing more jobs for young people th through that sort of investment. Wow, thanks and I totally agree on natural climate solutions. I feel like the RSPB has been talking about peatland restoration for literally decades and decades and still yet to see much progress on that when that, that's a huge carbon store that could be protected but also expanded as well if it's managed correctly. Uh, Gitan Jolly, do you want to go next? Um, thanks for that, Adam. Um, so I think, you know, governments can either, so all governments around the world are really looking at designing recovery plans. And as they do that, there's a choice of, you know, just following the status quo um, because that's what they've known how to do and that's the easiest to do at the moment or they can choose sustainable recovery. Um, and so in addition to our government, I think this is where our government can show leadership um, in that. And Ed's referred to some of the plans in place and the opportunities to be able to do that. Um, and, you know, in terms of taking up some concrete examples of if we look forward, I think is really looking at, um, you know, I can't stress enough, uh, and this panel's referred to it a number of times, it's really looking at the protection and restoration of natural ecosystems. Um, because that's going to be really, really important. The work that the RSPB is doing around peatland restoration, the work that we've been doing around the world in terms of grassland restoration in Nepal um, and other places, these are extremely vital ecosystems. And I think there needs to be a focus around that um, because it has a bearing on how we progress and recover as we go forward. Um, I think the other thing to focus on is that there needs to be a reduction in our dependence on fossil fuels 
And this is a you know perfect example. You know what Ed mentioned. You know absolutely stunning images of looking at the clarity um, as we had reduced pollution levels and a halting in air travel, but also just in terms of the number of cars on the road. Um, and I think this is an opportunity for our government, but governments around the world to really look at the international cooperation around green energy um, and looking at clean energy. Um, so I think there's huge potential around there. Uh, but other than that, I'm going to echo what Ed said. And it's really looking at, I think at the moment, we seem to be treating symptoms. So we're looking at the health as a silo. We're looking at the economic recovery um, as you know, one big piece. But I think what we need to be looking at is really how do we bring climate change, how do we bring the natural ecosystems and the recovery as an intrinsic part of this recovery plan? Because as we referred to in this in our discussions throughout this evening, it's looking at the fact that you know we've got to the stage where we've got to because of the fact that the ecosystems are broken. Um, there's things that need to be fixed, and we are in ever closer contact with you know, there's going to be more disease emergence. We need to be really looking ahead. It's not a one-time fix, but it's really looking at it from a concerted perspective, looking at how do we build that closer, the behavior change, building a closer link of with communities, with nature, and adopting a more holistic approach in how we go about recovery. Yeah, uh, thanks. And then finally, Jane. Well, uh... I suppose in brief, I think policies need teeth. We need to see real substantive change to encourage us not just to give space to nature, but I mentioned earlier about being seen as the part of nature, that we are giving space and coexisting with the rest of nature and that we need to incentivize change. So just as the other two have said, we need to make sure that our policies, like for example, the Environment Bill and our 25 year environment plan, they need to be deeply integrated across our economy, not seen as sort of separate things. Um, they aren't separate, they, they must be deeply integrated. We also need um, some good news stories and we need to build bridges between stakeholders. You know, HS2 is a very good example, as are driven grouse, moors, predator control, even starlings last week. There just seems to be so many issues that must make this, you know, hairs on people's backs raise where whoever they are feeling, God, this is awkward. Why can't we just agree on how to do these things? How can we be, um, how can we find a way where people can make a good living from the land and also at the same time enhance our biodiversity? And, and I, even biodiversity is a very distant foreign word almost. It's a, what does that mean? We're talking about wildlife, life, you know, try and, try and simplify things into normal everyday language and try and, Bring th make things realistic and relevant. Um, we need systemic solutions. Again, we've touched on this a little bit. If we can embrace the complexity of a situation that we face, not only the pandemic, but climate change and biodiversity loss, extinction, yeah, let's use that word. Um, we, we are facing a very bleak future, sadly, as a planet and as a species and, and our neighbors on this planet. Um, we have to do something about it. And I think embracing that complexity is absolutely central to it. That doesn't mean we need very complex solutions. It means solutions can be quite simple, but they can be replicated. Uh, in my work, that means at a catchment scale. So for example, if you're restoring a river and you just look at a pond or a stream, you're never going to get anywhere. We've done some good trials across Britain for different species reintroductions, for example, or different types of landscape management, but they're usually piecemeal. We're now at the time when, yes, there might be a little bit more science to do to make sure we check all the balances and all the rest of it, checks and balances, but, but now it's time to scale up these different initiatives. I, I'm involved in releases and, and reintroductions at the moment, uh, but you could pick any of these different things. Same thing applies. We need policies that support people to enable them to do it. And that means balancing, for example, protection with management. If you have wildlife that is so heavily protected that people then just get the gun out and the poison, we're gonna, we're gonna lose that battle. If on the other hand, we lead with education and we, lead, and we listen to people and we don't blame, and we try and get people to work together, then the farmer, the fisher, the forester will not feel persecuted like an animal might do. They might be felt like, as we said earlier, about like being one of us. So balancing policy that has protection and management at its heart, for example, is, is an example that we should consider. Also, when we talk about natural climate and biodiversity solutions, um, it is absolutely right that we have put a lot of investment into technology in the past. I've spent quite a lot of my career working in renewables, for example, and investment for that. It's a good thing to do and it's essential. We do need technology, but we still have quite a sort of mechanistic view of conservation. 
in this in this country and across uh, many parts of the world. Uh, I think we need to step back. I, I, I don't tend to use the word rewilding when I give talks or when we as a team work together because it can you know ruffle feathers in some camps and I understand why. So let's not use that word. Let's just talk about wild. Let's talk about nature. Let's talk about coexistence. Those sorts of words that allow space for hedgerows to, to blossom, for rivers to braid and naturally meander across our land. Um, we also need to make sure that we engage the disparate stakeholders and one of the things that we're doing as an example and you, you've asked for some examples is uh, we're creating a, a, a proposal for DEFRA and Natural England with I think about 40 different organisations all, all the way if you were to try and draw up a list you could imagine who they might be on um, from fishing farming and forestry and from the NGO sector and landowning groups. And our idea is to have a, a national strategy that will inform government policy and work with EA, Na uh, DEFRA and Natural England to be able to come together so that we unlock horns. And no longer do we have, I don't know, uh, a fishing or a farming community getting upset with a conservation body, but to recognise that in our case, beavers are back. Most people don't even know that. They already exist in our waters in many hundreds. So how are we going to live with them again? They're quite wonderful animals, but they can be disrupted. I'm just using them as an example. And then finally, funding. Uh, well, there's actually quite a long list now of new initiatives. Uh, the English tree strategy that um, uh, Rebecca Powell and Zach Goldsmith are developing. I was involved in a round table with them not long ago with some other organisations and we've submitted a briefing. Isn't it wonderful that a small startup like us can be asked to contribute to something like that? That's encouraging and I believe we're being listened to as well. And it's trying to think of not just funding, you know, large scale forestry projects where you've got things wrapped in plastic tubes. It's trying to relook at what a tree is. What do we mean by forest? Does scrub included in that? Is what was a, as a riparian wetland, wooded wetland, does that include, should that be included? What do we do about old, old um, legacy funding? How do we transition to new so that people who are land managers are not going to suffer if they've had funding for something and then it's removed? The Nature for Climate Fund that's recently been announced, quite a few hundred million pounds there that are there to, to invest. Uh, development offsets, again, um, talked about a lot, but when I've talked to people who are in, in that field, they find it very difficult to find projects that will qualify. So somehow we need to make these things more simple so that a developer can develop and then they can offset and do within a local community, preferably, do some good works in the environment. And then even things like the flood budget. You know, the flood budget is usually spent on concrete and metal. Why don't we do, or, or digging big holes, why don't we try and channel some of that into biodiversity and natural climate solutions? And then finally, I think one of you mentioned earlier about environmental land management, I think Adam did. Um, environmental land management um, on paper looks great. Uh, the tests and trials uh, that are being considered, I think it's about 200 of them all together, Using my organisation as an example, if we could pay farmers simply not to plough and use chemicals up to the edge of a river and put 20 metres either side, something like that, and pay them to do it so they don't lose income, most of the issues that we will encounter with animals like the otter, the beaver and those sorts of animals that are returning to our waters, they'll just go because we're no longer trying to plough the same land that is going to be, become a braided river system. So there's an example there where the environmental land management scheme, if it has teeth, if it works, then it could make a big difference to inspire, incentivize, incentivize and inspire uh, not productivity, but good ecological stewardship. Uh, thanks. And yeah, I totally agree on, on giving incentives to farmers. I mean, I'm, I'm sure everyone is aware of the Nature Friendly Farming Network. And I, I went out to Martin Lines's farm, of, uh, I think it was last year or so, but just kind of um, like understanding what, what farming and, and farms can look like when you're not focusing solely on, you know, production and actually giving space for for nature and actually it's the farming as a whole is is kind of more productive as a result of giving that space for nature and especially as well on the kind of battle against you know never-ending like technological solutions that are going to save us i think we're all a little bit worried about um you know 40 million for for nature restoration but then 100 million for dominic cummings as uh, sucking co2 out of the sky sort of sort of thing and when we already have trees and peat and stuff that can do that function perfectly so i think that's definitely a fight that ngos need to continue um I, there's just a couple of questions from uh people that are listening right now uh so laura says how can we connect more young people to nature that live in inner city areas or don't have immediate access um, are there existing schemes that we can promote to people so that they can get involved and how can we continue to apply pressure as activists to ensure that funding is provided to improve access? So I know that um, 
the Glover Review that was released nearly a year ago now had the quite interesting proposal to take all inner city kids for a night under the stars in a, in a national park and maybe that got a, a greater amount of press coverage than any of the other really useful recommendations that they also included. Um, so I'm just wondering if anyone, I mean, it's kind of up to you, the speakers really, who wants to come in on that, if they have anything that they'd like to say. I would just say, um, before I worked at Ashton, I worked for the Wildlife Trust for quite a number of years. And one of the trusts I work for, the London Wildlife Trust, has an amazing project that targets disadvantaged BME young people in London. Um, I can't quite remember the name of it, but I'll, I'll try and post it in the chat. Uh, so there are some very, very good targeted projects out there that are looking to engage young people and being specific about targeting disadvantaged young people. I think there needs to be a lot more of them, uh, quite, quite honestly. And I think also aligned to that, I think the environmental movement needs to really consider the Black Lives move, Matter movement as well and how it can really integrate racial justice into how it recruits its volunteers and young people as well. So I think, I think those, those things are really important. I think there are some great projects that, that are beginning to focus on that. But I think we need we need more of them. Um. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would echo that actually. What Ed has said, I think we need to be more inclusive. Um, you know, there's some really great citizen science work that's being done, um, and across all of our organisations that are represented here, there is some brilliant work that's being done around engaging young people and people from disadvantaged communities, and in, you know, bringing them closer to nature. Um, and I think citizen science projects are a brilliant way to do it. Um, we need to make them more inclusive. We need to, you know, reach out to communities rather than expect people to just come to us. Um, so I think there's a great deal of work to be done there um, to make sure that we are reaching out and we're making it as inclusive as possible and reaching out to communities that would benefit from it. We know that the data suggests that uh, being closer to nature has mental well-being. Um, you know, factors that we really need to consider. And I think that needs to be integrated within curriculums. We need to be reaching out to policy leaders and making sure that it's well integrated so that we've got a more holistic approach to the way that we are doing our conservation. So we're not doing it in silos as we have been doing, but doing even better. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. And um, uh, I think we should remind ourselves that the, the, when the question is talking about uh, the urban population and um, and also we should remember the youth population too, um, nature exists perhaps bizarrely uh, often more in built up environments than uh, in our countryside. Our national parks sadly don't have the same high levels of biodiversity as some villages and uh, and, and common land. Um, the, the nature recovery networks that are being more and more recognised through along hedge, hedgerows, uh, road verges, canals and rivers and so on, these, these permeate and crisscross all of our towns and villages and cities. So anybody really, as long as they're physically able to do it, um, can get into something that comes close or uh, gives them the feeling of being, being amongst wildlife and the, and the natural world. Um, the, the citizen scientists has been mentioned a couple of times already. An example, um, Earthwatch's uh, Riverwatch, which has been going for a long time. Um, there are many projects like that where it's not only does it uh, provide a very valuable, and it has been shown in, in sci through scientific research mm -hmm. that the science mm -hmm. that's generated, the data that's generated, is very valuable because you're talking about thousands of data sets that you wouldn't have if it was just two PhDs. You've got your two PhDs and 2,000 dog walkers and uh, children walkers out there counting butterflies or whatever it is. So the monitoring value is very high, but the, things like nature deficit disorder and ecological tidiness syndrome, these things are real. You know, shifting baseline syndrome is a new one that people are talking about, or at least new to most people, where we forget what we're born with. I was born in the early 70s, and I distinctly remember in the 70s and 80s having to wipe the windscreen of the car for my dad regularly as we were driving along in our battered old Ford Cortina. When was the last time any of us had to wipe our windscreen because of the number of flies killed on them? It just doesn't happen anymore. We're so used to the, the, the sort of deprived um, uh, natural world that we now live in. So, um, I think that, that then leads on to communications um, and education. It's absolutely essential that we inspire people. And I know all the people on this call are, are working directly in, in that work, uh, either them or their colleagues. If we can um, 
not only targets the traditional uh, NGO, large NGO membership, but their children, their grandchildren, their urban, their, the, you know, as you, as you mentioned earlier about Black Lives Matter, the whole, any, any opportunity to help a movement, a central movement like that, to, to, to remember that climate and nature and biodiversity is part of it all. As Jason Jolly was saying earlier on about the COVID crisis, this came from a natural world. You know, this is, this is the, we, we, we've, we've removed all our rainforests, or a lot of them, and we're now living cheek to jowl with wildlife and, and diseases are hopping between us. And that with industrialized farming, um, uh, you know, pigs is a, the, 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 a big worry, obviously large pig farms. Uh, we are going to have more of these diseases. So can, can we get more, can we communicate better? Can we share enough information that, not scares people, but reminds them we are in a bit of trouble here, but then incentivize and we talk about a, 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 a dialogue of or discourse of abundance. And then finally, art and creativity. Uh, we're finding in our small charity, just doing new competitions and quizzes and getting people to submit videos. And just today, my, my I'm rather jealous actually, my colleagues are with um, an animator from the um, Ardman Animations organization, the Wallace and Gromit people, down at our beaver pond in Cornwall. And they've been creating some beaver puppets out of clay. And we're going to be launching a video on that. And how can you make your own beaver out of clay? I mean, those sorts of things. And I, I just realized here, look, here's things that my daughter's made. So I've got a hand on my birthday was the other day. And we have this made out of pressed flowers. I don't know about you, but they're beautiful. Little things like that can do huge things for a child and for a family to connect with nature. Might have to nick those ideas for future quarantine crafts. I think I'm, running, I'm slowly running out of, of things to do stuck in the family home. But um, I mean, I don't know about everyone else, but I, I'm almost a little bit embarrassed when you hear those uh, statistics about the conservation environment sector being one of the, the whitest sectors in the UK, I think only after farmers. And I think that's why um, initiatives like Black Birders Week last month were so important. It's kind of changing people's understanding of, of what like engaging with nature is, and it doesn't have to be, you know, getting your thousand quid binoculars and going out to the middle of, of nowhere and to see a bird, it's actually just kind of on your, on your doorstep, really. Um, um, and can I chip in there, Adam, because I think one of the things that's really important, you know, I'm glad that you raised it. I think there is a level of, you know, how do we make conservation more inclusive? Because at this point, a lot of us are in it because we've got families who were able to make sure that we were able to do the unpaid internships, we were able to you know, follow our passions. There's a lot of people who have a similar passion, but who just don't have the economic means. So as an organization, we've taken a really strong stance to say, we will not do unpaid internships. You know, things like that, there's things within our remit that we can do to make sure that it's as inclusive as possible. How do we reach out to those disadvantaged communities and really bring in those citizen scientists from communities that we know will benefit from being amongst nature? So I think that's a really, really important point. And if there's one takeaway that we take away from here, it's about how can each one of us enable um, conservation to happen on our doorstep in whatever form whether it's the Garden Wildlife Health Project, whether it's monitoring the health of the Thames down, you know, monitoring the eels and looking at what's there. It's each of us has a role to play within that. It's not something that's happening out there. It's something that, you know, we can enable on our doorstep and each of us has a responsibility. Could I just add uh, to that, Adam? Um, I, I used to work until recently with an organization called Blue Ventures that is a marine conservation organization that I'm sure um, Ed and Justin Jolly will know. Um, Al Harris, the founder and um, CEO, uh, took me out to Madagascar a couple of years ago to uh, witness for myself the, uh, the situation within the urban environment. And then we went out into the southwest and we spent quite a few weeks with a particular community called, uh, at a place called Andavadoc. Um, and Davidoc has about 2,000 people uh, living mostly without any form of sanitation, no regular sort of supply of food or water, no electricity, and using uh, dugout canoes to go out and fish every day. Um, Al and his team over a number of years worked out that the best possible way to try and engage that community and to try and help secure their future 
was to try and develop a combination of what they called locally managed marine areas. So the emphasis being locally. So it wasn't a white person like Al going to uh, a, a native population who had been living there for thousands of years, who were then being told what to do. It was the opposite. It was to go and listen and ask questions and inform and suggest things and very, very gently. And, and this can be applied anywhere in the world, by the way. It's not, not just uh, somewhere like Southwest Madagascar, where you go and listen, you, you, sow, you seed ideas, and then you come up with solutions that they will they were inspire conservation. So in their case, they, the population grew and they started, um, their, their techniques were damaging the reef and the, the supply of fish and particular octopus uh, which thankfully are fast growing, was diminishing rapidly. So they worked out that if they just shut down the fishery just for a few months, then suddenly life returns. And whilst that's happening, they then developed other alternative livelihoods. So if you have those two things of locally led conservation and then livelihoods that don't conflict with conservation and diversify their income, it meant that women were not having to work all day and bring up eight children or something because they also had health care, they had family planning education, um, and, and that families as a whole were not looking for when their next meal was going to happen. So there was a radical shift, and, and that particular organisation I, I'm humbled by the work they do, 200 and something staff dotted around the tropics, working in communities that are very, you know, really struggling. And now with COVID-19, you can imagine it's even worse. Um, these things work if people listen and they inspire people and give them a sense of empowerment. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll go on to Josh's question in a sec, but I just think um, for my own interest, really, I'm, it was mentioned at the beginning about the kind of uh, the role of the indigenous groups can play in conservation and in like environmental protection. Um, I saw a really amazing presentation at the Oxford Real Farming Conference about this farm in, in America where they were kind of rediscovering, uh, it was run by BME, a BME group and they're kind of rediscovering traditional like African uh, methods of doing agriculture and it was also a kind of a tool to kind of get back in touch with their, their kind of heritage and their culture. Um, but I'm really interested in how we would kind of understand that in the UK con context as well. Um, I was just wondering if anyone had some thoughts to say on, on that, really. I think it's quite complicated in a way. So, I mean, I think, you know, we, we you know, historically before enclosures, we had the idea of the, the, the commons, didn't we, of common land that held collectively by small communities. But in a sense, the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution destroyed that connection. And that's where some of our problems come from. Um, I, I, I think it's not necessarily about land rights and land ownership in the UK context, although it might be in the global south, that might be more important issue. But it's about uh, feeling involved in co-stewarding um, land in some shape or form. And I think there's greater scope for things like the land trust movement to, to have more traction in the UK, for, for communities to hold land in trust, in common trust. And, and I think, you know, there's a great book, which I'm sure some of, some of you have read by uh, Guy Shrub Troll on who owns England. Uh, I think it is opaque. Uh, and I think that is an issue. Um, I think there are some really well-intentioned land managers and landowners, and we were talking, James and I, about the Nep estate, which is near where I live, who have really good intentions around rewilding and, and nature conservation. So we need to acknowledge that, but we also need to acknowledge that, that uh, land ownership is, is still in the hands of very few people in the UK. Uh, and that, I think, is, is a problem for nature conservation. Exactly how it's a problem, it's difficult to describe, but I think, I think uh, it, it, it plays to that lack of connection in some shape or form. I don't, I don't know. Mm. If I, 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 just to add to that, I'd say that um, it's, it's, I would agree with all of that. And, and it's, the, the need is to break down the um, emotional, uh, it's not so much physical barriers, but the no. emotional and cultural barriers between so-called landowners and landowning groups. And, um, and so, for example, if we look at the farming sector, the concept behind cluster farms, where farms 
uh, who neighbour or are very close to each other work together. This has been going on for 10 years or more and has huge success rates because rather than the hedgerow or river or road seen as a boundary, it's mm. seen as a, a fringe between two or, or a margin of opportunity between mm. two different stakeholders that may even be related and often are in, in, a, in a rural community, for example. Um, we, we, within the Beaver Trust, we have a, a campaign and, and a film we're about to launch, which is called Beavers Without Borders. And it is exactly that. It's all about, we're using beavers as our humble ally. What can we, how can we learn from these cheeky, productive, humble, hardworking, bit troublesome in sometimes <laughs> these animals? Um, and, and what can they show us about working together with others? They are highly collaborative species. Um, beavers without borders, humans without borders, whatever it is, if we can try and think differently about whose fault something is, and rather than, rather than think of it in that way, but how can we solve the challenge together, then whether we live in the countryside or a built up area won't make any difference. We should be able to make quite a difference. Wow. And finally, I just want to get to Josh's question. So it neatly ties into what you were saying, Ed. So he said, um, so I'd like to know whether there's an opportunity to look at changing our relationship with the environment through projects like rewilding the Nepa State in Surrey. And what are the main barriers to having more of our low uh, productivity land turned over to nature? I don't know whether someone had uh, kind of 30 seconds to a minute that they wanted to say on that. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to, to say something. Um, I think one of the big challenges with uh, rewilding and, or, or allowing land too wild is, is the level of productivity of that land and where it's based. So if you're looking up in, in the highlands and uplands, then it, you, there might be a, a greater opportunity uh, where uh, the, 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 there might be a stronger argument in some cases, but not all, because obviously there are things like uh, pasture farming and uh, uh, sheep grazing and things that have become very traditional since the Victorian era, and, and, and rightly and understandably, communities are very reliant on that and, and, are, and are very used to that. So there has to be a lot of respect given to people and not telling people what to do. If it comes from them and they wish to allow some of their land to return to a more wild uh, or, or natural uh, management system, then that's fine. In lowland, typically lowland downstream, uh, you know, in, in the level, level land areas of our landscape, it's very, very difficult to justify because this is where we grow our food. And whilst um, it would be wonderful in some cases to be able to think that we might be able to set aside more land um, uh, in large areas. I think personally that we're going to see some of the greatest impacts through nature recovery networks. So just simply by allowing a, a hedgerow to be rather than two metres wide, 10 metres wide, imagine how it, all that, those miles of hedgerow that automatically and that the difference that will make for productivity is very limited, particularly when we look at environmental land management as an example, so that it can incentivize people. Oh, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I, don't, I just spotted Adam's question, but I think we might just not have time for it. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't even really know how to sum up that. I feel like it's been a very like wide ranging conversation, but I mean, super interesting and a lot of things for me to take away. And as I'm sure that all the participants as well, I mean, just, just a few things, especially, I mean, kind of focus on intact ecosystems rather than just kind of fragmented habitats, I think is, is super important and getting political parties, especially away from this kind of uh, tree planting arms race about 1 billion or 4 billion or, or whatever, and kind of focusing on landscape scales, as well as obviously, you know, kind of um, the role of indigenous knowledge and kind of getting out of our silos. I mean, especially working in coalitions like LINK, I think there's so many NGOs and they each do their little thing and then we're basically all doing the same thing, but we never talk to each other. And actually those moments when we all come together, such as for the, the virtual mass lobby that the Climate Coalition did a few weeks ago, I think those are quite like profound moments really when you have, you know, development charities, uh, energy charities, nature charities, all kind of working to a common goal, I think is super important. If the NGO sector is going to kind of really you know, have an influence over this government and the kind of direction of policy over, over the next year. But, um, yeah, I just want to say thanks to all the panellists. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope everyone that's watching or kind of watching the recording afterwards has, has found it useful as well. Um, yeah, nothing else to say from me, really. But thanks, guys. Thank you, Adam. Thank you.